We've got about six pages of verses this morning we're going to go through, so you're not going to be able to flip through to all of them. But I've got a couple of points I want to make this morning. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to read a whole lot of verses to illustrate those points. But I was asking God this past week what he would have me share. And, and, and you know, I don't usually do seasonal messages and I was going over all kinds of different notes and all kinds of different sermons and sermon ideas and things and I was sitting there at my desk and I was thinking about I, I think I I don't I don't even know what brought it up. But something brought up the thought of visiting a king. And I was sitting there thinking about it, and I thought, you know, Jesus is the only king we can really freely access. You know, all of, all of the kings of the world, um, you either have to have a special invitation. Uh, even our president and dignitaries of our different countries, you know, you can't just walk into the Oval Office or walk into the White House or... Uh, or, or any of those things and in the, the other countries that still have kings and queens and things like that you can't just just walk in and and demand an audience with them but you know King Jesus we can Amen. and uh, in Matthew chapter 2 verse number 2 we'll start at verse number 1 but 2 is where I want us to and, and I guess this may be where the idea came from the thought came from and then God just kind of brought it together in a whole bunch of different verses. And so I just began jotting them down and it got to be more than I wanted to jot down. So I started copying and pasting them and uh, just just going over different verses and stuff. And, and it was kind of, and I, and I didn't get nearly all of them, but it was kind of amazing how many times God or Jesus or whatever was referred to as the king or the kingdom or the king of kings or whatever. And Jill was talking about earlier about the, the angelic host that announced his birth um, to the shepherds, and they were the, the low class of the day. Um, but he said, unto us a Savior. And, and we think of a Savior probably as more highly represented than a king. But when the wise men, and we don't know how many it was, and we don't know what nationality they were, or, even how long they've been traveling, like she said this morning, it's been estimated it was sometime between two and three years that they were actually traveling. If you see a nativity scene with the wise men and the shepherds, you know that they're not scriptural because they weren't there at the same time. The shepherds were invited to the stable. The wise men got there a couple of years later into the house where baby Jesus was there down in Nazareth, I think you. somebody said it out loud for me. Um, and so there were two different occasions but we see here in Matthew chapter 2, when the wise men got to Herod, uh, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born, what? King of the Jews. King of the Jews. The king. Now Herod was the king at the time. He was the physical king at the time. And so these guys are walking into his, his presence, and they've probably been you know, allowed in, and they said to him, where, where is the one? Because if anybody knows where the next king's going to be, it ought to be the king, right? No. So they walk into his palace, and, and they say, you know, where is he that is born king of the... In other words, where is your successor? We heard, we studied, we followed the stars, we've, we've been searching the scriptures for years and years and years, and I don't know how long these magi had been studying the stars. I don't know how long they had been studying astrology and astronomy or whichever the word is right. Um, but, but, but they had been studying for a long time and they figured out that this particular star that they had seen was the star that was going to lead them to the, to the king. And so we have here the, the identification of the wise men that have been studying for far longer than I ever have. And they have identified the place where the next king is going to be. Now, we say, well, Jesus was just a man. Well, the Bible calls him a little bit different. He said, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is which is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth came a sharp sword, which is to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. 
He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of the God Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's over in Revelation. Jesus answered, I think this was in Matthew. I didn't write down the references. I was just thinking about different ones. And he said, my kingdom is not of this word, world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. And then Pilate said to him, so you're a king? And he answered, you said I'm a king. And for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Then verse another one, it says, For unto us a child is born, a son is given, a government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, and on the throne of David over his kingdom. So we're beginning to identify that even the Old Testament scribes Old Testament prophecies, New Testament scribes, New Testament prophecies, New Testament magis who had studied the book, they are all identifying him as king. Now, the Bible says in other places, it says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. So you've got all of these different people, all of these different places that are identifying him as the king. You go back to, to Daniel. I saw in the night visions, and behold, the cloud of Dan heaven there came like the son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, were presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. If you've got a kingdom, then that makes you a what? A king. All right? Then in Revelation again, they will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And those that are with him are the chosen and faithful. And it goes on, and there's, there's numerous other verses that identify him as the king. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings. And so that puts him even higher than a king. And so we've got, we've got the fact established that Jesus Christ is king of kings. We've got, the, we've got the fact established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. And so we have, we have it pretty clearly defined that Jesus is a king. We have the wise guys, the magi, the wise men, however you want to identify them. Um, they said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Now, my title was, we have, Jesus is the only king we can freely access. So we have an established fact, excuse me, that Jesus is king. But we also have an established fact, according to the word of God for the next six pages up here, that we have access to that king. We don't need special permission. We don't need special clothes. We don't need a special haircut. We don't need a special baptism. We don't need a special anointing. We don't need a, a special anything to come to Christ, the King. We can walk, the Bible says we can come boldly into the throne room. We had all of the kids were there yesterday. All of the grandkids were there yesterday. All the son-in-laws were there yesterday. <laughs> And, and every single one of them came over to the house. They walked up to the front door. They opened the front door. I could have been sitting in there in my underwear eating Cheetos. But they just opened up the front door, walked right into my house, went straight to the refrigerator, opened up the refrigerator, went to the stove, went to the pantry, went to the garage, got my down Mountain Dews. Some of them even got some of my m and m They walked in my house just like they belonged there. They walk in my house. They come boldly, just bouncing into my house. Some of them running in and out. Some of them going in my refrigerator, getting my Diet Mountain Dew, going in my cabinet, eating my oatmeal, getting water. They act, they act like they had rights to be in my house. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> because we're family. We're family. Yeah. Jesus said we're family. He may be a king, but we're family. And he said, you come boldly into my house. He said, you come boldly into my throne. He said, ask. He said, you have not because you ask not. Ty, Ty, Ty is pretty respectful. He said, Papa, can I steal? <laughs> that I'm not doing. <laughs> uh, you usually don't ask permission to steal something, but yeah, baby, you can have it. You know, it, it's, it's like, your family 
and, and, and we can we, we it's it's hard for me to imagine. I know where I came from. I know what I am. I'm I'm a poor sharecropping, half breed, farmer's kid, you know, alcoholic family. I, I'm nothing as far as the world's concerned. But according to God, the creator of this universe, he said, come on in the house. You're welcome here. I could if 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 heaven had a had a portal. Yeah, if I do that, I'll get off camera and I will make somebody mad. We'll pretend a piano is a door. Okay, y'all use your imaginations this morning. You imagine you got a good preacher every Sunday, so you can use your imagination. So we got a piano right here. This is a door. Okay. Brantley, this is a door. It's not a piano anymore, it's a door. <laughs> So this is heaven's door. And there's no lock on this door. Matter of fact, it probably doesn't even have a knob on the door. For those of you who are familiar with the old school bar rooms, it just has swinging doors. You just push right through. And that's the way heaven's door is to us. The Bible says you can come boldly before the throne. You can just walk in like you belong there. It doesn't matter whether you're a half-breed like I am. It doesn't matter whether your name was wrong. It doesn't matter whether you come from the wrong family. It doesn't matter whether you were a slave or a, or a king. It doesn't matter. You're equal in God's eyes. And, and so he says in Psalms, it says, Who may access into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, my hands, you know, this one's pretty clean because I washed that one, but I can't wash this one a couple days. But, but that's not talking about our physical clean hands. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Bible says if I've confessed my sins, I'm clean. He says my sin is as far as the east is from the west. I don't care. God doesn't care what you and I have done in our past. When, when we ask God to forgive us, and our responsibility is to ask those we wrong to forgive us. Now, if they don't know you've done them wrong, don't bother them with it. <laughs> you know, if, 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 if Amy has a bad thought towards me, <laughs> and I don't know she has a bad thought toward me, she don't have to tell me, hey, preacher, I called you a nerdy name. <laughs> and I apologize for it. She didn't call it to me to my face. Yeah. So don't worry about it. Just, God, I, 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 I shouldn't have done that. And God says, okay, fine, it's done. Don't do it no more. Because that's what he told the lady who was caught in adultery, remember? Neither do I condemn you, but go and sin no more. In other words, don't screw up anymore. And, and so he says, who, who, can, who can come in? He says, anybody has got clean hands and pure heart? Isaiah says, open the gates that the righteous nation may enter. Just, just fling them open. The righteous nation, not the individual picked out few. The righteous nation. Anybody, everybody can come. Revelation says, whosoever will, let him come. If you, if you want to go to heaven, all you got to do is work it out with God. He, man, you ain't got to work it out with me. Because some of you I wouldn't let in. Because heaven, heaven ain't going to be heaven if you and me both are there. Because <laughs> there's going to be problems. The kids were talking about yesterday. They were going to they cremate me and Rose and they're going to mix our ashes together. I said, you mean I got to spend all eternity with her? <laughs> Which will be a pleasure, by the way. For those of you on the internet that think I don't love my wife, Jeez. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Romans says, through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, we can exalt in the hope and the glory of God. One of, one of my favorite ones is, is a question. It says, for what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God, whatever we call on? Pharaoh asked a similar question when, when uh, I think it was the children of Israel. He said, who, who, who is this God? And, he went, and God proceeded to show him who his God was. And, and, but we have access to this God. We can come freely into this king's throne room. We don't, we don't have to have... You know, if I go to Melvin's house, which I probably am, I'm not one of them pastors that visits the congregation all the time. You won't see me come to church. <laughs> but if I go to Melvin's house, 
I'm going to walk up. I don't even know where he lives. We were riding through Dunmore the other day. Rose says, you know where Melvin and Tia lives? No, they ain't never invited me to their house. I don't know where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if I were to go, <laughs> I think he don't need to invite me to work. <laughs> Yeah, if your house on fire, I'm going to have to put it out. It's all right. But but if I were to go to their house, and Melba's not a king, right? And, and Melba's not a king, is he? He ain't even close, is he? But if I were to go to their house, I would walk up. If they got a sidewalk, you got a sidewalk? Uh, pathway. You got a path. That's good enough for me. That's what I'm used to. But I would walk up to the door, whichever door they choose for to go in. Y'all use front door, back door, side door? You use front door? Front door, yeah. The one, I, would, I would go up there, and the first thing I'll do is, and what am I doing? I'm asking permission to come into your house. I'm asking to speak to the owner of the house. I'm asking, well, maybe I better ask to you. <laughs> I'm asking permission to access the premises, to access your presence. God doesn't require a knock. Matter of fact, it's just the opposite. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. Yeah. If any man will open the door. It's us that has to open the door, not Jesus. Jesus says, my door is wide open. He says, whosoever will, let him come. And so it's Jesus who's standing at our doors asking permission because Jesus is not going to force his way into your life. Jesus is going to stand there and knock at your door. And if you want to have fellowship with him, you can open the door. If you don't, it's your loss. You know, it's like I told a boss one time. He was talking about something, and I said, uh, you know, he, he disagreed me on, on a certain subject. I said, that's okay. I said, you can be wrong if you want to. <laughs> and it's the same It's the same way Jesus says to us. I'm going to provide a way for you not to have to go to hell. If you want to go to hell, that's your choice. God gives it. See, we, we talk about God giving us a choice to go to heaven. I think it's kind of just the opposite. God gives us a choice to go to hell or not. He says, I've already paid your ticket to go to heaven. The door's wide open. If you want to go, you can go. But if you choose to go to hell, that's your, that's your choice. You can do that. He's not going to force his way into our lives. And so he says, Ephesians says, in whom we have boldness and confident access to him through faith. We, we, we can... Vinny, let me see. Uh, Y'all are pretty popular. You probably never felt this way. You ever walked in somewhere or walked in a store or walked in somebody's house or walked in somewhere that you didn't feel like you were welcome there? Y'all might not be so good to me and your in-laws. <laughs> but, but he says, we can have... You ever, how many of you grew up poor like I did? None of y'all grew up more like I did. You lying? <laughs> y'all, y'all might have, y'all might have had, you know, just P O O R, but we were so poor we had four O's in our pool. But, but you ever felt like I tell you what, one of the things that turned me against church many, 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 many years ago was we were the uh, what did, what did they call it? We were the less fortunate family in church. So we got invited to one of the more influent families of the church. And we got to sit around with such a privilege and watch them open their gifts. Such a wonderful day for my life. I felt so welcome. I felt so honored. And so I, I felt very out of place. I, I felt out of place when I was trying out for basketball. And I didn't have the right kind of shoes. I felt out of place when everybody else had the Converse and I had the Kmarts. I felt out of place when everybody else had the new clothes to start school and I had what somebody else had already worn out. I felt insignificant and insecure most of my life. I still do, to a point. Even though Rose made me wear this cinch vest. I can't even spell cinch. <laughs> yes. I know, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> kid. <laughs> but but for, for most for the majority of my life, and I still I still battle with about feeling not good enough. I, you know, I, I love Rosa Jeff, and she means absolutely nothing by it. 
But I cleaned up around the sheds and the shacks and stuff the other day, got it all cleaned up. And I, I showed her, I was so proud. She's got about it for three or four years. And I brought her out there. I brought her out there and I showed her. And she didn't see all of what it cleaned up. She said, why is that still here? <laughs> and just it just jumped. It just it just added to my not being quite good enough. And she meant nothing by it. I mean, there was no harm in that. She wouldn't harm a, 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 an emotion that I ever had, even though she is a big bully. Um, but it just added to my not ever being good enough. And that verse says, I can walk boldly and confidently into the king of this universe. I can walk into heaven's door just like I belong there. And I know I don't. I know I don't. I know who and what I am. I know who and what I've done. But he says, I can be there. I think that's pretty cool. Y'all got all the tissues out there somewhere? No, I got one right here. Okay. Hebrews says, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and grace in a time of need. How many of you spiritually this week have felt like you had a need that only God could take care of? What did he say? that we can find mercy and grace and help in a time of need. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. God ain't interested in your fake. God ain't interested in your pretend spirituality. People that pretend to be Christians irritate me because I know what it is to be a pretender. Ephesians 3 12. You might want to just write that one down. In, excuse me. In whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in Him. Now, we exercise our faith to have that confidence. But where do we get the faith from? He says to every man is given a measure of faith. So the only faith I have to trust Him, He gave it to me. Yeah. So everything that I need to trust him, he gave to me. It's not something I have to come up with on my own. He already gave me enough faith to trust him. Now I have to exercise that faith. It's just like all these massive muscles I've towed around hidden under my cinch vest. I have to exercise them to be able to keep them. Some of them I'm keeping well under wraps. <laughs> Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Not just visit. Not just come check in. I get to dwell there. I get to live there. Isaiah says, listen. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you. A promise between God and me. Mm -hmm. I might unintentionally break a promise to you. God never has mm -hmm. and never will. James says, draw near to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Mm -hmm. I'm already on page four. Psalm says, how blessed is the one you choose to bring near to you, to dwell in your courts, and you'll be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. How blessed is the one that God chooses to let us in. Hebrews 10 says, 
Brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, a new and living way which he has inaugurated for us through the way of it. Y'all remember when Jesus was crucified and the veil was ripped into? It was ripped from the top to the bottom. That shows God ripped it into. See, because remember the Old Testament tabernacle? You got the you got the outer court, the inner court, and the holy of holies. And only certain people at certain times could go into the holy of holies. And it was separated by a big old veil. And God said, Nope, Jesus has paid for all of that. Yeah. We're done with that. The veil's done. Yeah. We're gonna rip it down, and anybody and everybody can come in. That's right. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Anybody in here know what a sharecropper is? A sharecropper is somebody. Um, that's that's how I was raised. It's the people own the farm, and you get to live there. And you get to work on their farm. <clears throat> and then you get a part of what you make for them. It's kind of like what Tanner does. Tanner works for a ranch. And the, the ranch provides the house. And they provide, you got a vehicle or no? Not well, I use my own. You, but they, they pay you for your usage of the vehicle? Yeah. Okay. So, so basically, he's making a lot of money for the owner. And the owner pays him a portion of it. Mm -hmm. Now I understand his new owner, his new owner <laughs> um, is is a little better to him than the last one, and and so God says I'm going to give you the kingdom. He says you you're not going to work for me. You're not going to be. He says we're no longer slaves. He said I'll call you servants and I'll call you friends. Yeah. So we made that transition. It, we we made that transition from being a sharecropper to an owner. I see uh, Shields commercial there once in a while. They're, they're owner operators. I see these trucks going down the highway sometimes, owner operators. And, and, and you know, it's when you, when you have ownership in something, you take a little better care of it. You take a little better pride of it. You work a little harder for it. And so we have ownership in, in, in God, we'll take a little better care of it. I don't know, I just. Jesus is the only king that we can freely access. We can, we can just walk in there like we belong there. I don't know if that means anything to you or not, but, some, but, 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 but people like me who's not always been allowed in places. I went to a place one time. I don't know why or how. I think I was working for a company and they went to a big fancy restaurant and you had to have on a coat, but not a, you know, a suit coat thing. Now, a lot of your churches, they'd have felt right at home, but I don't have a suit coat. Well, I take that back. I've got one that uh, I've got the church ball for me many, many years ago. But traditionally, I don't wear suits and coats and things like that. And so I walked into this place, and, and it said, you know, you have to have a coat to be able to go in there. And I wasn't allowed into the restaurant. I had a pocket full of money because it was company money. But because I didn't have on the right clothes, I couldn't go in there. There's some churches that way. If you don't have the right clothes on, you're not welcome there. I went to a church. I drove six hours to preach in a church one time. And I'd made the appointment. I had it all scheduled and everything. And I went in. And uh, I got there early like I always do. And I introduced myself to the preacher. And I told him, you know, I was scheduled to preach that night. He said, you're not preaching here. I said, did I get my schedule mixed up? Did, did something go wrong? Did, was I under a wrong impression? He said, we don't allow nobody to preach with a beard in our church. Okay. You can believe what you want to. But the I, last time I read the Bible, they said that they plucked out Jesus' beard. Yeah. So Jesus wouldn't have been welcome there either, I guess. I guess it was pretty good company then, man. Jesus was kicked out. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, internet and all, I'm just saying. I'll get all kinds of emails on this one now. <laughs> You're going to die and go to hell, okay? Jesus said I ain't, but I got free access. <laughs> but I don't, I, don't, I don't always have the right clothes. Somebody might not like my hairstyle. It might be too long or too short for somebody. You know? You surely going to die and go to hell. All this wrong hair. <laughs> You keep your long hair, baby. It looks good. Thank you. 
You want to look like a lion, you look like a lion. <laughs> Lions are strong and tough. But we have, we have, we have, if, if I don't get nothing else across to you today, you can walk straight into Jesus' house just like you belong there. All you have to do, believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Yeah. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Mm -hmm. My righteousness is a filthy rag. I understand that. There is absolutely nothing good about me. Except my looks. <laughs> nothing good about me. But God says, when he sees me, he sees clean. Yeah. Yeah. He sees holy. Yeah. He sees righteous. Yeah. And not only that, but through him we have access in one spirit to the Father. We can all go in together. Or we can go in one at a time. How many of you feel like you belong in heaven's throne room? How many of you are glad you do? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't feel like I belong there either. <laughs> it, it's funny, you know, I, I, I tell people, if you only knew who I was, you wouldn't like me. You know, if you only knew what I've done, you wouldn't like me. I was, I was, and I, I try to say that to Jesus. If you only knew me, the world would. <laughs> yeah. He kind of does. <laughs> because Jeremiah, I think it's Jeremiah, says, before I formed me in the belly, I knew you. And he also said, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you. See, Jesus knew me before I was even a twinkle in my daddy's eye. Jesus knew me before I was even conceived. He knew what I was going to be. He knew what I was going to go through. He knew how I was going to feel. He knew how I was going to turn against church. And just in case any of you are listening that have a problem with church because somebody at church had hurt you, mm -hmm. name me one person that hasn't been hurt. Yeah. I hear all these people talking about, well, I had a bad childhood. I had a bad childhood too, but it ain't going to stop me from living. No. There's things happened to me. I told you a while ago how, how church had hurt me. You don't stop me from coming to church. I don't blame the church for something some idiot did. No. Well, that's pray for a little of you. Make excuses <laughs> about not coming to church. Because who hasn't been hurt? You've been hurt on your job, but you're still going to show up tomorrow, ain't you? <laughs> Some of you, like me, live with a bully. You gonna show up at home? <laughs> Some of your kids have hurt your parents. They didn't throw you out. Some of your parents have hurt your kids. I agree. When they get a certain age, chunk them. I paid rent from the time I was fourteen. I understand completely. But but God says, "Only." Matter of fact, he don't even have to say, come on in. He's already given us an open invitation. Yeah. Matter of fact, a lot of times somebody ring the doorbell or whatever. Kevin comes over sometime and he'll ring the doorbell. Door's open. I don't know whether it's Kevin or not. I can holler, door's open. Because if it ain't Kevin, somebody got problems. But but God says, just, just the door is open. And I say to you this morning, God's door is open. If you've never trusted him with your life, the door's open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've never given God your, your soul, God, the door's open. Yeah. All of you that labor and are heavy laden, come in and I'll give you rest. You got problems in your life? Give them to God. Yeah. He says he'll bear our burdens. He says my yoke is easy, my burden's light. Give it to him. Quit toting it around. It's like I was telling you a few weeks ago about staying up all night. God says he never sleeps nor slumbers. If he don't stay awake, they don't need me to do it. Now I was back up again at 5 o'clock this morning, but it won't because of, because of my hand was throbbing. You know, it's, it's, we, we, we don't utilize all of what God has given us. God has given us peace. God has given us joy. God has given us all of these things. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And we have access to all of that. We have access to the king. 
I don't think any of us can really realize and understand that, but I'll tell you how you can realize it. Drive over to Washington, D.C., drive up into the lawn of the White House, and get out and walk up that sidewalk and see how far you get. You know, it, but God says you walk straight up to heaven's door, you push the door open, you walk in, come boldly before the throne room, and when you get in there, you can ask anything you want to. And he has the opportunity to say, no, not right now. Yep, it's on the way. I'll take care of that. Because he says, not my will be done, but his. No. And I'll be, I'll be frank with you. Sometimes that's the hardest prayer you'll ever pray. Yeah. It's for God's will to be done instead of mine and yours. Because we like to pray in multiple choice. God, you can answer it with A, B, C, or D. We don't give God the option of E and F. But a lot of times God says, none of your above. I'll take care of it my way. And you know what? I found out in my short life that whether I understand it or not, God's way is always better in the long run. Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes we have to go through hell and back again. But it's always the right way. As in my life, sometimes God uses a tragedy bring us to the place where we need to be. God uses something that's not so pleasant. Something that may even hurt to bring us back to where we're supposed to be. Because I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere and with my attitude I didn't care. I don't feel like I belong in the throne room with Jesus. But since he said I could come, I might as well take advantage of it. You know, if I said this morning, then I ain't, so don't get your hopes up. Anybody in here want a $100 bill? <laughs> Jesus said, any of you burdened? Any of you heavy laden? Any of you worried? Any of you scared? Any of you confused? Any of you anxious? Any of you heartbroken? I said, come on in the house. We'll talk about it. So, all of you, almost all of you, raised your hand. Want that hundred dollar bill? Jesus says, you want peace? Mm -hmm. Give it to you. Yeah. See, we're quick to jump on that hundred dollar bill. But Jesus has laid peace out there for us. Mm -hmm. He's laid comfort out there for us. He's laid understanding, wisdom, all of the things that he said. We don't raise our hands for that. We don't come running through his phone room for that. You'll take peace. <laughs> I'll take a piece of peace and a piece of joy and a piece of understanding <laughs> and a big bucket of wisdom. I, I got to the place in my life where I just take about whatever Jesus wants to give me now. But anyway, just, just remember, when you feel out of place, when you feel insignificant, when you feel like a nobody, in God's eyes you're somebody. And he says to you, come on in. Come on in. i tell you how I picture myself and then I'll shut up and go home. He says I can come boldly into the throne room. But more often than not, I go crawling into the edge of the throne room and I ease up to his lap where he's sitting on his throne and I lay my head down on his knee. And a lot of times I can almost feel mm -hmm. his hand just, mm -hmm. it's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I got it. Yeah. I got it. You stay here just as long as you need to. Mm -hmm. But when you realize I got it, mm -hmm. get your butt up and get on back to work. <laughs> God and Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we do ask that you would help us to understand.